Uh, hello, this is Dr. Morris, and I am doing the introductory lecture to Anatomy and Physiology 1. Uh, this is the first of a series of lectures for A&P number 1. Again, my name is Dr. Stephen Morris. Uh, my website is posted there on the uh, syllabus uh, at smorris at hsc.usf.edu. Office telephone number 813-974-2069. And then you could also reach me by my cellular or voicemail number. That's 813-298-5525. And again, this is the introductory lecture into Anatomy and Physiology 1. Many of you in the class uh, have taken uh, other forms of anatomy previously. And I just want to start off by talking about some of the other branches of anatomy uh, and how we'll be approaching anatomy, which may be the same or maybe a little bit differently from how you've approached anatomy and physiology before. One of the topics I'll talk about, uh, or one of the subcategories of anatomy, is comparative anatomy. Uh, in many of the undergraduate courses or pre-college courses that you may take in high school, do more of a form of comparative anatomy, where uh, different types of biological systems are compared to the human system and that's more or less an approach to learning various aspects of anatomy. As you can see on the slide represented here, uh, we can see the developing uh, embryo of the salmon, a chicken embryo, human embryo. Uh, now when we talk about embryos, this is more of a developmental type of anatomy, but if we compare those organisms to, say, the human embryo, we have a form of comparative anatomy. Uh, also, you see in the illustration the uh, anatomical structures of the adult salmon, the adult chicken, and then uh, in the lower right-hand corner, you see the adult human organism, which again have similarities in the structures of the other organisms we're comparing it to, similar vertebral columns, similarities in digestive systems. However, there are gross differences as well. In the course of study that we are undertaking for this semester in a and 1, we will be exclusively looking at the human anatomy and the human systems, understanding not only identifying the anatomical structures themselves, but appreciating the functioning of these organ, organ systems as well. When we talk about uh, anatomy, I would like you to think first about uh, anatomical structures starting at its smallest level. And as we think about a human system or a biological system at its smallest level, we have to think about a molecular or anatomical structure first. And the, the first series of lectures that will follow this one will talk more about the molecular structures that make up the biological system. We will then go to various organ systems uh, as we build upon that concept. So if you look at the uh, slide that's before you now, as you look at atoms and combinations, atoms and combinations will combine to make molecular structures. Molecular structures, again, we will talk uh, a lot about in the following and the subsequent lectures. As these various molecules combine and form uh, various cellular uh, components, of the human body. We will talk about cellular anatomy in the subsequent lectures as well. Cells that combine, that carry out the same function, typically referred to as a, a tissue or a tissue level organization, which we will talk about as well in subsequent lectures. And a tissue structure or a combination of multiple cells that form a tissue that carry out the same operation are referred to as an organ system. And it will be these organ systems that uh, we will study a lot more in detail. We will get into the organ systems uh, as a part of anatomy and physiology part one. But those of you who take A and P part two uh, in the following semester uh, will get into uh, the other organ systems as well. So this is the approach that we will be using for A and P one. As you can see, there are multiple structures on the external surfaces of the human body. Many of these external surfaces you'll have to identify over the course of uh, the semester. There are also 
positional relationships that you'll have to appreciate as well. This slide, again, is an illustration out of your textbook. You will have to appreciate and know. And if you have to commit these to memory, I would do so at this point. Understanding the anatomical positions of the body when we refer to cranial and caudal, cranial referring to the head, caudal referring to the tail or the inferior aspect of the spinal column, anterior, posterior, or posterior dorsal, anterior referring to ventral surfaces of the body. You'll also have to understand, obviously, right and left, and understanding that when uh, uh, you're looking at an anatomical structure, you're basically looking at a mirror image. So the mirror image that you're appearing, the left will actually be on your right, and the right will actually be on your left. You have to appreciate a proximal point, which means closest to the midline, the distal point, which means further away from. Also terms used uh, are lateral uh, side, meaning more toward the side of a given uh, anatomical structure. So these are anatomical positions that you will have to know and be very familiar with. Your book has a table which identifies uh, some other uh, anatomical structures that you'll have to be familiar with uh, as far as the orientation of the plane. As you can see from this uh, uh, table, table 1.4 taken from your textbook, you can see the various planes that you will also have to be familiar with. Transverse or horizontal planes, sagittal, mid-sagittal, parasagittal, and frontal or coronal planes are just uh, uh, anatomical locations are planes that will help you to identify specific organ systems. In the study of anatomy, it's important that we all are talking the same language. Uh, in a clinical setting, you will have to um, appreciate various views of the human body. There are multiple diagnostic studies uh, that only uh, take pictures based upon these anatomical planes, so it would be important that you become familiar with them. Um, as illustrated here, again, this slide is taken from your textbook, you can see where the human body has been divided into several planes. Most notably, the uh, anterior uh, plane, uh, which uh, anterior and posterior planes, which are basically uh, divided into uh, frontal uh, planes, as you can see on the illustration. Then there is also a sagittal plane, which basically divides the body uh, into uh, right and left halves. Uh, there are a number of diagnostic studies that use this approach uh, in study. Um, the MRI, or the magnetic resonant imaging uh, uh, scan, basically will take pictures of the body in a sagittal plane. So it's important to be able to identify these and appreciate the understanding. The other uh, table also out of your book is directional terms. Uh, this pretty much covers uh, most of the various regions of the body anterior ventral surfaces, posterior dorsal surfaces, cranial cephalite surfaces, superior caudal, inferior medial lateral, proximal distal, superficial, and deep, all of which are important in helping to determine anatomical locations in the human body. So you should become very familiar with these, not only the definitions of these, but use the illustrations to help you to identify the various positions that they refer to. Now, the other concept that's important to understand is the concept of body cavities. Our body is composed of, or the human body is composed of, multiple cavities in which organ systems may lay. These cavities have specific functions not only to provide a um, protective uh, network for some of the organ systems, but also provide a fluid level to decrease friction uh, in certain surfaces. Uh, especially when we talk about the cavity that surrounds the heart, the cavity that surrounds the uh, digestive system, all are fluid-filled mediums. A very thin layer of fluid surrounds these various organs and decreases friction. Organ systems such as the heart, the lungs, and the GI tract are in constant motion, and because of that, they need surfaces that surround them that decrease this level of friction. Um, and so we see with the heart, and the illustration again taken out of your book, if you think about the cavity that surrounds the heart, the pericardial cavity, it's more or less like a balloon. 
a balloon that's not fully inflated. This balloon happens to feel, be filled with fluid. And if you take your fist and push it into the center of that balloon, you'll see the chambers of the balloon actually surround your fist. A similar chamber or cavity surrounds the heart. Uh, inside that fluid, uh, inside that chamber is fluid, the pericardial cavity, which decreases friction on the heart when the heart is beating. A similar cavity sits around the lungs. A similar cavity is around the abdominal ca cavity and the pelvic cavity. Uh, and these are the various organ cavities that we refer to. You also see our, the brain is covered by a similar uh, cavity. Also, that cavity extends down the spinal column and covers the, the uh, spinal cord and uh, creates the spinal cavity. All of these are very important structures uh, in the human body. This is just another view, both a um, transverse uh, view and a, um, an anterior view of the various body cavities. Again, cranial cavity, spinal cavity, pericardial cavity, pleural cavity, and the abdominal and pelvic cavities as well. This illustration, also taken from your textbook, gives the uh, functions of each of the cavities. The ventral body cavity uh, provides protection and allows organ movement, uh, decreasing and preventing friction, as I've already alluded to. The thoracic cavity surrounded by the chest wall and the diaphragm. Pleural cavity surrounds the lungs, the mediastinum. Mediastinum is an area center of the chest, contains the trachea, the esophagus, and major vessels. Uh, the left pleural cavity surrounds the left lung, obviously the right pleural cavity surrounding the right lung, and then the pericardial cavity, which surrounds the heart. Um, you will also see in the abdominal pelvic cavity, there is the abdominal cavity, which contains the digestive glands and organs, and then the pelvic cavity, which contains the urinary bladder, reproductive organs, and a lower portion of the uh, digestive tract. There are multiple systems that we will talk about uh, through the course of anatomy. Primarily, we are dealing with uh, organ systems, but to understand the organ systems, again, we'll have to start at a molecular level, which is the smallest uh, portion of the anatomy, and then we'll work our way up to cellular anatomy, tissue structures, and then eventually organ systems. We will discuss the integumentary system as a part of uh, this course. We'll also uh, discuss the musculos, the muscle system. Excuse me. We'll also discuss the muscle system, skeletal system, integumentary system, um, the uh, other organ systems such as the cardiovascular system, lymphatic, respiratory, digestive, uh, and urinary system will be discussed. Uh, in A and P Part 2. The skeletal system, which we will discuss in later in the lecture series, contains the major organs of the bone, the cartilage, and associated ligaments, the bone marrow. The skeletal system's primary function is to provide support, protection of other tissues, stores calcium, uh, and other minerals also forms uh, blood cells. The uh, skeletal system will be divided and studied in two parts. One, the axial skeletal system listed uh, on this illustration, and then the appendicular skeletal system uh, also listed on this illustration. The skeletal system, because it's divided into two components, it will be um, important for you to differentiate uh, the two portions of the skeletal system. Again, we'll describe this in a lot more detail when the skeletal system is covered uh, uh, during that portion of the lecture series. The cardiovascular system will not be covered in A&P Part 1, but will be covered significantly in A&P Part 2. But we have to bring in the cardiovascular system. One thing to note about the human body, all of the systems that we will be discussing are interrelated. Every system in the human body depends on the other systems to function. The only system that actually doesn't fall in that category, there is one exception, would be the reproductive system. Now, the reproductive system is dependent upon all of the other systems for it to function. However, the reproductive system is not required for the other systems to carry out their function. In other words, 
for the cardiovascular system to function, it, is, it needs no contribution from the reproductive system. However, the reproductive system does need blood supply, needs oxygen and nutrients, and so it does require support from the cardiovascular system to survive. So all of the other systems in the human body, with the exception of the reproductive system, require the other systems for a re for, uh, to maintain adequate functioning. The cardiovascular system is dependent upon the circulatory system. The cardiovascular system is dependent upon the neurosystem neuro or the nervous system for it to carry out its normal function. We'll discuss these interrelationships as we discuss each of the specific organ systems. So though we will not be specifically addressing the cardiovascular system in AMP Part 1, we will, however, be discussing some of the contributions from the cardiovascular system to say, for instance, to supply blood supply to the integumentary system, to supply a blood supply and nutrients to skeletal muscles and to cardiac muscle. Um, so uh, again, systems are interrelated. When we look at the cardiovascular system, major organ systems involved there include heart, blood, and blood vessels. Primary function, distribute blood cells, water, dissolve minerals, uh, or dissolve materials, including nutrients, waste products, oxygen, carbon dioxide, distributes heat, assists in the control of body temperature. The endocrine system, very important system in the human body, uh, significant uh, organ systems related there, pituitary gland, um, pituitary gland, uh, thyroid gland, pancreas, adrenal glands, um, the uh, gonads, which are testicles and ovaries, endocrine tissue and other systems. Functions, directs long-term changes in activities in other organ systems, adjust metabolic activity, energy and used by the body. Uh, it also controls many of the structural and functional changes during development. The uh, digestive system um, uh, is also a very important portion of the uh, uh, body's uh, system. Uh, involves not only the oral cavity, teeth and tongues, but liver, gallbladder, large intestine, salivary glands, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, pancreas, small intestines, all important contributors to the digestive system. Again, this will be covered more in a and Part 2. This picture, uh, again taken from your textbook, again goes into a little more specific detail about anatomical location. The specific region that is focused upon here is in the abdominal uh, cavity. As you can see, the abdominal region is divided into several uh, components. The epigastric region, which is the area that lies just below the sternum or the chest wall, the epigastric region the umbilicus region, umbilical region, again, mid-level uh, abdomen, and then the hypogastric or the pubic region that lies typically below the umbilicus. It's important to understand and appreciate each of the anatomical regions, the right hypochondriac region, the right lumbar region, the right inguinal region, and the same on the left. The importance in this is in a clinical setting, if you need to identify the location of a specific organ system, Understanding these regions and knowing what organ systems lie in these specific regions is important. Now again, we won't go into a lot of detail because we won't be discussing the digestive system into the second semester, but the importance of this slide is just to help you to understand and appreciate the importance of understanding anatomical regions. If a person has pain in the right upper quadrant or the right hypochondriac region, we know that the liver is the primary organ that's located in that region. We also know that the gallbladder is located in this region. So from that information, from that clinical information, it gives us an idea of what organ systems may be involved in certain disease processes. If the person complains of right inguinal pain, we know that inguinal hernias can exist in this area, but we also know that the appendix can exist in this area as well. And so it gives us an indication of what anatomical structures are located at when we're trying to discuss or trying to identify particular patterns of a disease and or uh, anatomical location. So it's important to recognize that and the GI system is a good area to be able to uh, demonstrate the importance of anatomical location. This slide also further identifies 
specific organs in specific regions of the abdominal wall. In this particular illustration, the abdomen has been divided into quadrants. And so what is in the right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, and left lower quadrant are important. The organ systems are listed uh, there below. It's, again, important to have an appreciation of anatomical location in identifying diseases. Uh, the integumentary system will be de de uh, covered as a part of AMP Part 1. As you can see, the major organs that are located there include the skin, hair, sweat glands, nail, functions to protect against environmental hazards, help to regulate body temperature, and provide sensory information. The integumentary system is uh, further described uh, in this illustration. Again, because this is an introductory lecture, I will not go into a lot of detail. Uh, in subsequent lectures, we will specifically address and go into the integumentary system. But as you can see, not only are, is there the surface appendages that are related to the integumentary system or the skin, but then there are, it's a whole network or meshwork of anatomical structures that lie below the skin that are important for us to be able to recognize and to understand their functioning. And we'll go into a lot more detail when we go into that specific system. The muscular system, major organs, skeletal muscles, associated tendon, and aponeurosis, which is a tendinous sheet that helps to connect the muscles to the bone. Functions provide movement, provide protection and support uh, for other tissues, and also in the generation of heat that maintains body temperature. We may not always think of our muscle systems as the source of heat energy, but in severe cold climates, muscles will shiver and generate significant amounts of heat, heat enough to uh, maintain a body's uh, temperature, uh, in essence, maintaining a steady state or homeostasis in the body. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. The muscle system is quite immense. There will be multiple uh, muscle structures that you'll have to identify. But in also in identification of the muscle, it's very important to understand its function and its movement. To understand its function and movement, it is very helpful to understand these anatomical shapes of various muscles. The nervous system, very complex. Uh, several lectures will be dedicated to the nervous system in AMP Part 2. Uh, for uh, the purposes of AMP Part 1, recognize that a tremendous amount of support for the other organ systems is based upon uh, interactions with the nervous system. Major organs there, the brain, spinal cord, peripheral nerves, and sense organs, functions, direct immediate response to stimuli, coordinates and moderates activities in other organ systems, also provides and interprets sensory information about the external conditions. Various lobes of the brain are, will be discussed uh, when we do the, the nervous system in AMP Part 1. This is just a gross anatomical uh, image of the brain itself, dividing it into several lobes, the frontal lobe, the occipital lobe, uh, other regions including the temporal lobe, uh, and of course the parietal lobe, all a part of the brain. Again, we'll go into much more detail about these other structures, cerebellum and medulla oblongata, all a portion of the brain, but will be discussed in much more detail when we do the nervous system. This is a superior view of the skull. The brain has been removed and basically what you're looking at here is the lower portion, the inferior portion aspect of the skull. You're looking on the inside of the skull, the tissue areas where the brain would actually sit and rest. Uh, again, I won't go into a lot of detail at this point, but just to recognize that it, the the gross anatomical structure of the brain is supported by the skeletal system, which is basically the floor of the skull in which the brain would rest. This is a uh, just a sagittal view of the uh, brain uh, after undergoing a PET scan. This is a specific image uh, demonstrating uh, activity in the brain. PET scans are used for diagnostic uh, evaluation of uh, various uh, disease processes, essential in helping to identify certain tumors, uh, helps to identify circulation patterns inside the brain. It's a very important tool, but having an understanding and appreciation of the planes, the various planes of the body, helps uh, 
an individual who reads these scans, a radiologist, to be able to give accurate information because he has a well-versed knowledge not only of the anatomy of the brain, but also of the, the planes that are involved in these diagnostic techniques. The reproductive system will also be covered uh, as part of ANP Part 1. Uh, the female reproductive system uh, and the male reproductive system also the anatomical structures, not only will you have to identify these structures, but you'll also have to appreciate the functions of the various structures as well. And then uh, a key concept that's important for you to appreciate, and we'll go into a little more detail about this in the next lecture as well, is the uh, homeostatic regulation. Homeostasis is basically the steady state uh, of the body. And a number of various organ systems work together in unison to maintain homeostasis in the human body. Uh, it's important for you to recognize and appreciate this table, Table 1.1 from a textbook, the systems that are involved in homeostatic regulation. Now there are various aspects of the body that must be maintained at this steady state. And for the uh, 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 student to appreciate these systems must understand what types of support and functions they provide. For the maintenance of homeostasis as it deals with body temperature, the primary systems that are involved in that include the integumentary system, the muscular system, the cardiovascular system, and the nervous system. The integumentary system prevents heat loss. An example, the integumentary system, the skin, uh, covers our entire body covers the entire body surface. Not only does it protect us from the external environment, but it also maintains the heat of our internal environment. This is why burn injuries are so uh, severe and can cause many problems. Not only does a burn break down our primary mode of protection, prevents us from bacteria and mic microbes that may try to enter our body, but it also uh, preserves our heat. It insulates us. It, uh, and once that tissue layer is broken down, skin is broken, heat and body fluids are able to escape in an uncontrolled manner, which can severely alter homeostasis as it relates to body temperature. The muscle system, as I alluded to earlier, generates a significant amount of heat. When we go out and run or exercise, we can see the amount of heat that the body will typically generate in response to these exercises. In addition, in extreme cold climates, body will shiver and shake. This is the way that muscles help to generate additional uh, heat. Um, we also see the cardiovascular system. The blood is um, kept at a temperature of 98.6. And so for uh, other areas of the body to maintain that same body temperature, blood must be pumped to these various uh, areas of the body by the cardiovascular system so it maintains body heat. Also, the nervous system is very important in the coordination of blood flow. In extreme temperature settings, the brain sends signals to peripheral structures such as our fingertips and our toes to vasoconstrict those blood vessels so warm blood can be shunted toward more vital organs such as cardiovascular system and the kidneys. So we see the nervous system involved in the homeostasis of body temperature. should be familiar with those systems and their primary uh, function, uh, again, in homeostasis and body temperature. Other areas of importance include uh, body fluid and composition of nutrients. Again, we see the digestive system, cardiovascular system, rating one and two in this particular area. Nutrients and absorption and storage all are part of the digestive system nutrient distribution supplied by the cardiovascular system. Uh, the urinary system controls nutrient loss. We talk about the urinary system, you'll see how important that is. Uh, and then the respiratory system and the cardiovascular system, maintaining body fluid compositions of oxygen, carbon dioxide uh, uh, levels and others. Um, when we talk about the internal characteristics of body fluid volumes, we see the urinary system, digestive system, integumentary system, and cardiovascular system 
in those areas as well. I won't be redundant, but you can see the importance of each one of those systems and what they do to be able to maintain homeostasis and body fluid uh, volume. And waste product concentration, you see two systems mentioned. I dare say it probably should be three systems here. For waste product concentration, it includes the urinary system and the cardiovascular system. The urinary system for the elimination of waste products from the blood, I do believe that should probably also include the digestive system for the elimination of waste products from the digestive system. Uh, and then the cardiovascular system, which transports waste, waste in the form of carbon dioxide uh, and other toxins, ammonia. Ammonia has to be transported and uh, converted into uh, non-toxic substance inside the body. Uh, and it's the uh, cardiovascular system that has to provide that transport. And then for the maintenance of blood pressure and homeostasis, obviously the cardiovascular system, nervous system, and the endocrine system, which also supports these systems, uh, also involved. Endocrine system supplies various chemicals and or hormones that help to regulate body metabolism, and so it's equally important in the homeostatic regulation of blood pressure. The next illustration just demonstrates uh, uh, or compares our biological system with the thermostat at home. As you can see, there is the uh, uh, thermostat itself, which registers the temperature. There is a control center or a, a thermostat, uh, which sends the command to the air conditioner to turn it on. There's a response. And then there is the uh, maintenance of the normal room temperature, which is homeostasis. As the normal conditions are disturbed, if temperatures begin to drop, then the thermostat knows to kick on. That's if it's in the wintertime. If, it's, uh, if the body uh, becomes too hot, then in, it's in, uh, the comparison would be with the air conditioning system. The temperature goes above a certain point. The receptor, being the thermometer, registers that information and knows to turn the system on to condition the air. So it, it, uh, it's a very important and uh, very similar to the same system we see in maintaining the environment inside our homes with air conditioned um, with air, uh, with conditioned air, I guess I should say. The other factor that's important, and again, we'll go into a lot more detail when we talk about uh, the molecular uh, structures of the human body, but uh, for now, I just want to briefly mention pH balance. You will see this illustration again in later lectures. It's important to commit a number to memory. The normal pH of the human body is 7.35 to 7.45. The human body is a system that works efficiently within that pH range. Now, what is pH? pH is the acid-base balance of the body. And again, because this is an inter inter introductory lecture, I won't go into a lot of details about the um, pH uh, balance of the human system at this point. We'll talk about that much more uh, early on here in some subsequent lectures. But the body, again, works best in a pH range of about 7.35 to 7.45. Now this is a logarithmic scale. I'll go into more detail about that in the future. But as you can see from the number 7, it means that we're basically neutral creatures. We don't like extreme acidic environments. We don't like extremely basic environments. However, inside the human body, you will see some very wide pH ranges. In other words, in our system, we have, we have areas that have extreme pHs inside our stomach. Hydrochloric acid, hydrochloric acid, which you use to burn off uh, debris and dirt from my uh, sidewalk because it's so caustic. Clean out swimming pools with hydrochloric acid. Uh, very dangerous to uh, touch on skin can cause uh, corrosive injuries to tissue. However, to digest food and to kill the bacteria that we eat in our system, we have hydrochloric acid in our stomach. And it's a complex uh, environment, which, again, I will discuss in much more detail uh, in subsequent lectures, uh, not only about pH balance, but when we talk about the digestive system, how these extreme uh, pH balances can stay into place. In the same system, in the digestive system, we see saliva 
uh, is closer to a more uh, neutral uh, type of a pH balance. And then um, you can see some of the common things in our environment, oven cleaner, uh, household ammonia, extremely basic or extremely alkaline uh, pHs exist uh, in those particular areas. So it's important to understand the relationships of pH balance in the human system. Also a part of homeostasis is the turnover rate for certain cells. In certain cells in our body, um, when cells are produced, they last for a short period of time and other cells last for very long periods of time. Liver cells, uh, average recycling time, five to six days glycogen and cholesterol and various enzymes that are produced <clears throat> are, are obtained inside the body. <clears throat> this gives you the average recycling time of these various uh, components. Muscle cells, total proteins 30 days, glycogen supplies in there 12 to 24 days. Neurons have phospholipids and cholesterol will last 200 days plus. And then uh, fat cells, triglycerides 15 to 20 days. There are a number of electrolytes that are important. Again, this will be discussed more in subsequent lectures. Uh, you should start to become familiar with the various types of electrolytes in the body. Again, these include sodium chloride, which is basically table salt, potassium chloride, calcium chloride, sodium bicarbonate, magnesium chloride, disodium phosphate, and sodium sulfate, all important components inside the human body. And then we'll enter into the chemical and cellular level organization of the body. Again, um, the chemical and the cellular level organization in the human body is important to understand. The bodies are a, a set of building blocks, starting with the smallest uh, component and moving uh, forward. And we'll go into a lot more detail about uh, the um, chemical and cellular components of the human body in subsequent lectures.